So that was a brief intro to the SWE network itself, only going into the code library. But now let's actually take a look at some code and write our very own, our first SWE move. So before we do that, it's important to talk about objects. So just to reiterate, what are objects? Objects are essentially the building blocks of the suite network. As you can see, every object has to have these two characteristics. It has to have the has key keyword, and the first field must be this ID, UID, essentially this unique global ID. And as we uh, said, oh yeah, and objects can also be owned by an address. So that would be like Alice owning a token. Objects can be owned by another object. So if you want to think of like an RPG game, for example, and you're like a hero, and you're like collecting armor or tokens or whatever, these various items can be owned by the actual object itself. Objects can be shared, meaning like the DEX or NFT Mint, for example, which we were talking about earlier, that anybody can interact with. And objects can be immutable, meaning that people can only take a read-only reference to them. So let's say like you're creating a game, right? And you want certain attributes to be visible to everybody, but you don't want anybody to be able to change them, to mutate them. This will be an immutable object. And then as we said earlier, there is technically no difference between an object and an NFT. All objects by definition are technically non-fungible. So now let's take a look at our first few lines of SWE move. So if you want to create your own, your first few lines of SWE move, you will first have to have downloaded the binaries and you can go on the SWE website, the docs website, and I can type that link in the chat, docs.swe.io. Uh, oh, sorry, let me see if I can do the comments. No, I cannot, but yeah, if you essentially go to docs.swe.io, you will be able to see how you can essentially Download the SWE binaries if you haven't already and begin to code your first few lines of SWE. And once you do so, also don't forget to download the VS Code extension and anything else you need to do to ensure that you can actually uh, compile your code. So once you do so, let's say you have it completely downloaded, please enter in your terminal SWE move new car. What it does is that it essentially creates a, a new package called car. And that's the first car you see here. And then what you want to do is that you want to start populating the code, the, the page as you see, sorry, the ID as you see. So for example, we just have this SWE, we're using this import from the SWE standard library, the object, and we're populating the first object, the first car struct with these four terms. ID, because every object has to have it as its first field, speed, acceleration, and handling. And you might be thinking, what does the has key keyword mean? It's essentially saying that this object can be written to the global state. So there are a total of four different types of uh, att type attributes. The first one that we covered is key, because we want this object to live in global storage. And then there's also store, meaning that we want to give this object the ability to be stored inside of another object or struct inside of another object. And then there's copy and drop, which essentially enables the struct to be duplicated and destroyed on purpose. So this like fine grain uh, tuning essentially is what gives the developer that extra ability to do what they want with their assets as they see fit without, being, without accidentally doing something they don't want to do. So then we'll see that we want to use this following import, the transaction context, to create this new function, new. So as you can see, this function takes four variables, speed, acceleration, handling, and this one variable, this one mutable reference to a variable called transaction context, and then it returns a car object. So as you can think, so as you can see, you need to type in when, when calling this function, you need to enter these three parameters, the speed, acceleration, and handling, and it returns a car. And you might be thinking, what does transaction context mean and why are we using it? So essentially, anytime you want to instantiate a new object, you must pass in this mutable reference to the transaction context, or just CTX for short. And as you can see, we're using it in the ID field where we call object double colon new CTX, where we essentially create this brand new uh, 
unique identifier, this unique global ID for this object. And one of the many benefits of the SWE VM is that you don't really need to worry about how that happens underneath the hood. You can just simply type object double colon new CTX and you'll have this new object right, in, right before you. Oops, did I skip one? Yes, okay. So now uh, you'll see we're calling the transfer. We're using the transfer standard library import. And why are we doing it? So if we take a look at the previous function, it didn't really do anything. We instantiated a new car, but it was kind of just left in limbo. But now we want to actually create a car and transfer it to the person calling this function. And we can do that via this function now, create, which is a public entry function, meaning that anybody can call this function now. So it has the same four parameters, speed acceleration handling CTX. And as you can see, what we do is that we call the new function from the previous side, so the, from the previous slide, and then we call transfer. So we're essentially taking that car object and transferring it to the caller of this function, which is done via transaction context, double colon, sender, CTX. And then we created a car and we transferred it to ourselves. But how can we actually transfer the car to others? Can we simply just call the transfer double colon transfer function ourselves? No, unfortunately we cannot. Because if you go into the Swift standard library, you'll see that transfer double colon transfer is a public function, not a public entry function, meaning you cannot call that function directly. So as a result, you'll just create this transfer function wrapper around it, which is an entry function. So now you'll be able to transfer this car to another person, to another address. And then some rudiments, right? Uh, SWE move is very similar to Rust in that, let's say if you want to simply just call these, uh, get these stats, you can just call this get stats function, pass in the car as a read only reference because we're not mutating anything, anything and you'll get the three values. And then similarly, if you want to change anything, let's say you want to upgrade the speed or anything, you'll just pass in the car as a mutable reference. And the mutable reference now, because you're actually mutating the fields, you're changing it, and the amount. So, and you can just simply call the, what the function would look like, just self.speed equals self.speed plus amount. So again, just to recap, SWE utilizes an object-centric programming model and these objects represent ownership. So now let's take a look at a second part of an example. Let's take a look at this one module called car admin. So as you can see, we have the same three imports that we showed earlier, but now we have two things that are different. We have this admin capability object, and you know it's an object because it has the has key keyword and UID of its first field, and this init function. So let's, take a, let's talk about what that means. So essentially, an admin capability in SWE or SWE move is a design pattern that grants admin only access to a function. So if you only want an admin to be able to call a certain function, they must have the admin capability in their possession. And then this init function is a special function. Anytime you see this function called init, which is just a fun, and it, its name is init, I-N-I-T, and its only uh, parameter is the CTX, this function will only be executed once when this package is published. So as you can see, if we have this init function, it'll only be, trans it'll only be called once this package is uploaded, and it would look like all it would do is that would instantiate a new admin capability, and it would transfer it to whoever's calling this function, or whoever's publishing this package in this case. And this is a very common design parameter because it's essentially saying, hey, we're creating, I'm the one publishing this package, only I want to be the admin. So admin caps and init functions really go hand in hand in this case. So now if we want to call this create function, it would look the exact same as the previous one, but now we're passing in this read-only reference to the admin capability. So essentially this is saying you can now only successfully call this function if you have this admin cap in your possession. And you might see that the admin cap doesn't have a name, it's just an underscore. 
whenever you want to pass in an object into a function without actually uh, wanting to use it, for example, we're not doing anything with the admin cap, we're just simply showing it, uh, you want to prefix it with an underscore. So in this case, I'm just leaving it as an underscore, but if it would help you, you could also do something like underscore admin cap, and essentially it's the exact same. So just to recap, capabilities can be used to gate admin access for functions, and we can also use that in tandem with an init function to make sure that this cap, this capability, is only executed. So now let's take a look at our final example, car shop. So you'll see that we have these following imports now. We have this error message. The car object is the same, and you'll see that the shop owner cap, essentially it's just an admin cap still, but now you'll see that we have an actual car shop object. And you know it's an object because it has the two things that we talked about earlier. It has key keyword, and its first field is the UID, and it has the two other fields of price and balance. So it's essentially saying that so price is essentially how much a car will cost. In this example, and balance is how much C is in this balance. So if you take a look at like a normal store, for example, right? Like in real life, a store is analogous to a shared object because anybody can mutate the contents of that store, right? Whenever you want to go into a store, you give the store money, but the money flow is unilateral, right? You can't take money from the store. Only the shop owner can at the end of the day or week or month or whatever, actually withdraw their profits. You can't withdraw the profits. So money can only unilaterally go in. And same thing, if you wanna create a game, for example, you want people to be able to deposit money into your object, but you don't want people to be able to withdraw your money. So now our init function does two things. Our init function now initializes this shop owner cap and transfers it to whoever is calling, publishing this package. And it creates a new share object for a car shop. So as you can see, it's initialized the same way, ID, object double, colon, new CTX. So it's still an object, right? But you'll see that it doesn't belong to anyone. That's why we just call transfer double, colon, share object. It just puts it out there for anyone to use. So. And then, yeah, the price is 100, so this would be 100 speed, and we initialize the balance of the shop as zero. So whenever we want to create a new shop, we have to initialize its balance as zero as well. So now, if we want to call this buy car function, you'll see that we have the three following parameters. The shop, which is a mutable reference to the car shop. Payment, which is a mutable reference to the suite in our wallet. And the transaction context. So the first line of this function is a simple assertion. It's essentially saying that I have at least as many SWE in my wallet as the price of the car. So if I call this function and I don't meet this criteria, I will get this E insufficient balance error. And then you'll see the next three lines of this code, really the meat of this function. So let's go through it together. So first line, let coin balance equals coin balance mute payment. It's essentially saying, hey, we have this coin in our possession, we have this SWE in our possession, but we just want the balance of that coin. So what we do is essentially we take that coin and we unwrap it. So if we have, you can think of coins and balances in the following scenario. Let's say coins only come in this shell and you can only transfer the shells to people and you can actually own that, that coin shell yourself, but you can only actually manipulate it once you take that shell off. So that line is essentially taking that wrapper out and you're left with the balance. Then you say is you let paid, you set, uh, you call balance double colon split, coin balance shop price. So you essentially unwrap the shell and you only want as many coins or balance as the price of the car. So the first uh, parameter to that function is the actual coin that's now balance and how much you want it to cost, so like 100 sweet. And then once you do that, you'll then call balance double colon join. And you're essentially taking that amount that you stripped and you're pending it to shop.balance. And as you can see, it's a mutable reference because we are mutating that balance. And then once you do that, we, the 
shop now sends, initializes and transfers that car to you. So again, it calls the object double colon new because it's initializing this new object, giving it base values of 50 across the board for speed acceleration and handling. Then it transfers it to whoever is calling this function, the transaction context sender. So let's talk about more about the relationship between coin and balance. So this is from the Sweet Standard Library under coin.move and balance.move respectively. So you'll see that struct coin phantom t has key store. It's essentially saying that this coin of any type type t has, is an object because it has key and you can store inside other objects, which is why it has store. And you'll see that all it is is just a balance is a wrapper over the balance object. So let's go one step further. What is balance? It's essentially saying balance of the, that same type T has store, meaning you can now store this balance inside anything, this coin or other more exotic types that you can create yourself. So you might be thinking, why do we have this difference between coin and balance? Why not just use coins? Why do we have this separation? And the separation is so that developers have more granular control over what they can do with the various balances and how they can create new exotic coins. So something like USDC, where they can uh, put certain addresses on a deny list, for example, or a block list, you can do something with balance now. You don't have to use the coin implementation. You can create like a new moderated coin, for example. And then these are just certain other functions from the SWE standard library where it's essentially saying how you can manipulate coins and balances and how you can go back and forth between the two. So yeah, if you are a developer, and especially if you're building a DeFi app, I would more than recommend going through the SWE standard library for coin, balance, anything that has to do with transferring money to see how you can create your DAP and how you can further optimize your, co your code. So now let's go back to the rest of the function. So yeah, it's essentially, you saw what we did. We went through coins and balances. We did uh, various operations between taking the coin from our balance, sorry, taking the coin from our address, taking that wrapper off, getting the balance, manipulating the balance, and then appending that balance to the car object. And then finally having that car be transferred to our uh, address. Um, so again, just to recap, we went over two different types of objects in this example, owned and shared. We went through two different types of transactions, simple and complex. So the car itself is an owned object. Anytime we want to transfer an owned object to another address, it would be a simple transaction, a transaction that bypasses consensus altogether. And on the flip side, we saw that the car shop, however, was a shared object. Anybody can interact with that car shop, but those interactions, those transactions would be subject through subject to consensus. And as a result, it would be what is known as a complex transaction. So own object, simple transaction, shared object, complex transaction. Those two go together. Then finally, as we were talking about earlier, we want only the shop owner to be able to collect the profits, right? So I'm in a Starbucks right now. When I ordered my coffee, I could only put money into Starbucks. I couldn't take the, star the money outside of Starbucks or else I would be stealing. And similarly, we don't want people to be able to steal in our uh, app or game as well. So by limiting whoever, by limiting the collect profits function to someone with a shop owner cap, it's essentially saying the same thing as, oh, only the owner of the shop. So Starbucks, car shop, only they can withdraw money. So as you can see, this is a simple function that just takes what we saw earlier. It takes that balance, wraps it into a coin, and then sends it to whoever's calling this function. But the biggest thing is only one person can call this function. And it's the person that actually has their shop owner cap. And again, we're just prefixing it with an underline because we're saying we don't really care. Uh, we're not really doing anything with the shop owner cap. We're just reading it. 
we're not like using it in the function. So if you actually get, if you were to give it a normal name, let's say you were to call that first variable like, uh, like shop owner cap, for example, the function would not compile. It would error out just saying, hey, you're passing in this func this variable, but you're not doing anything with it. So you have to at least prefix it with the underscore. And then just to recap, shared objects are objects that can be accessed by anyone. And Sui's design architecture is unique in that in the sense that allows for these single writer owned objects to forego consensus altogether and reach near instant finality. So thank you so much for joining me on wherever you're watching from. Here it's 10.30 a.m. But I'm hoping that we did get viewers from around the world. So it might be a little later where you are from. So for example, where I'm from, I'm originally from Virginia. It's interesting because it's 12 hours behind. So it'd be 10.37 p.m. there. But yeah, no matter where in the world you watched from, thank you. This is also recorded. recorded. So for future participants who are watching this at a future date, Thank you for listening to all 38 minutes of it. And yeah, thank you so much.